Friday. And welcome back to the Reimagine Together Conversations, the uh, conversation series where we're talking about new paradigm leadership, what that really means, and what sort of new paradigm societies can emerge as we start to find the new paradigm within us. If you're interested in this sort of content and these dialogues, you're a new paradigm seeker, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel or go to the Facebook page, like, and uh, contribute and, and, and uh, let me know what resources and what big questions you have right now. Uh, and we'll kind of be guiding our conversations around that. And today I have the amazing, uh, beautiful friend and uh, amazing love researcher, Samantha Thomas, back to continue a conversation around love in conflict. And today we're gonna to be talking about applying that through boundaries and contracts. So the fun part of love. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one of the hardest parts of love. <laughs> yeah, that is. Um, if you are one, if uh, see any of the earlier conversations with Samantha, they are in the links below as well. Um, but let's go ahead and dive right in. With, you know, we hear so much about boundaries today, or maybe I'm just, I've heard a lot about it. Um, or seen a lot of, I'm, I'm thinking of Instagram. <laughs> Seeing a lot in Instagram. What, let's just talk about what, what a boundary really is. Um, and maybe a few different, we're going to talk about what it, what it means uh, largely, and then a few different examples of a boundary, just so we can kind of get on the same page with how we're talking about it right now. Sure. Well, I think that the actual definition of a boundary, like if you Google boundary, it's something probably like, I actually looked it up earlier, like a defining line. So we can think of drawing the line, setting a limit. And that can be applied to so many different things, right? A physical place. It can be um, applied to an emotional kind of situation or the way that we feel about something. I think that today we're going to talk more about that boundaries as they relate to us as individuals and the boundaries that we create in our minds as they relate to particular situations in our lives and where we need to draw the line for ourselves in certain situations in order to come to that situation with more love. And actually, I'm just reminded now of Brene Brown, who mm -hmm. said once that the most loving people are the most boundaried people. And actually, she used the word compassionate. The most compassionate people are the most boundaried people. And I remember when I heard her say that for the first time, it took a while for me to understand what that meant. I had to really think about it and analyze it and feel it out for myself. And then I realized that what she meant by that, so I'll give a very simple kind of, uh, yeah, simple example. So Carly, if I, say you wanted to come visit me mm -hmm. here in Nashville. And I was like, oh, I don't know if I want Carly to come visit. I am gonna be working next week. My space is small. I don't I really need my space. It's hard for me to focus when I have someone in my space. I don't have a guest room for her. But I really want to see Carly. I love Carly. I know she wants to come visit. So I'm just going to tell her to come anyway. Then fast forward, you come and you visit. And I'm kind of feeling this resentment because you're in my space because I'm tired. I need my space. I knew I needed my space, but I did it anyway. I had you come visit anyway. Um, but what ends up happening is that when you're here with me, I'm not able to be as loving to you as I would have been if I had set that boundary and I actually said, you know, Carly, I would love for you to come visit, but I actually need you to go, I need you to stay somewhere else because I need my space. Then, and I need to go to work, I need to be focused on that. When I'm not at work, I can hang out with you. Then when you are here and when I'm with you, I'm able to show up and be totally loving because I'm not holding that kind of resentment in my heart. So. For me, it that just kind of put things into perspective that you know the most loving people are often the most boundary. Absolutely, absolutely. And so, if we look at it, um, the, the the concept of boundary is to create space for the self mm -hmm. to um, actually be able to show up more in a situation. Now, 
uh, I love that. And that's kind of the why behind boundaries. I already feel like sometimes that can be um, hijacked a little bit, <laughs> I guess. You know, where we can see a lot of kind of like boundaries, like, well, you just need to get people out. You know, it can kind of have this whole, um, this really kind of harsh side to it, which I understand. And we can speak to a little bit of, of that nature of a boundary as well. But um, but what we're talking about and kind of that way of love and loving through conflict, using boundaries to create more love, not to close people out. Now, <laughs> in the context, what are some kind of healthy ways when we look at creating those boundaries? Let's look at some of the reasons why we would need to create a boundary. And, um, and that's when we can kind of look at the different shades that it takes. Mm -hmm. And the, in order for it to, I'm creating more space so that I can love you, so I'm going to create boundaries. But that, it's having to do, those boundaries are coming from a place inside of me, right? That's saying, I, gets back to our earlier conversation on needs, whatever the individual needs might be. Um, so maybe if we can just kind of walk through a little bit the process, mm -hmm. so different for every person, of kind of knowing like how do I even start the process of thinking about boundaries for myself? What is that? What's kind of the baby steps of noticing when maybe I need a boundary? For sure, that's a really good question. I typically start with tuning into how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. and getting really honest with myself about what a situation's making me feel like, what a person is making me feel like, or maybe not even what they are making me feel like, not to blame them per se, but just, it's just the reality or nature of the situation. There's something that feels off. There's something that's agitating. It's something not sitting well with me. So really tuning into that. And it can be a very, I found difficult to tune into my feelings and, and, and that um, it's been helpful for me in my therapy practice with my psychotherapist for her to really push me to be like, well, how do you feel about that, Sam? Not what do you think about it? Because I tend to intellectualize things so much and analyze. I'm very analytical to the point where I even analyze and intellectualize my feelings. <laughs> so to sit there and actually be like, okay, this is to kind of try to tune out the noise of the mind and really sit with how I'm feeling in a situation. And then, I mean, there are so many reasons why we might not feel good in a situation with, it could be many people, it could be one person, but for the sake of this conversation or just this example right now to make it simple, it could be someone that is pushing their views on us maybe in a way that doesn't feel comfortable to us. Like we never really have a say in the conversation or our opinion isn't heard because it's always about the other person and how they feel and how they say something. And that actually brings me to love, which love is all about extending ourselves for the other and our ability to see the other's perspective and to empathize with that. And there's actually this book called The Agony of Eros. Eros means, you know, there are many different kinds of love, agape love, philia, which is like universal love. There's philia, which is friendship. There's um, eros, which is passionate love. Anyways, that's what eros means, the agony of eros. And in that book, the philosopher that wrote the book talks about the importance of not being narcissistic and being able to see the other side. And we live in a society that is very much individualistic um, and focused on the self, right? And so being able to recognize in a situation when maybe we're showing up and we're not creating enough space for that other person to really be their true selves and also share who they are and their perspective. So kind of to bring it back full circle, if we're in a situation, it could even be like a political conversation with someone, right? Where say we have different opinions, uh, we and the person we're in conversation with have different opinions on a subject and one person is just pushing their opinion and saying, this is the right way. 
um, you should believe this because of X, Y, Z. And it doesn't leave space for us to, to say, well, what about my opinion or can we open this up and be more open-minded and innocent approach this situation from a place of innocence and can I have some space to share and be recognized for how I feel and how I see a situation um, so it's really when I say that love is about extending ourselves for the other it's not that we forget ourselves it's about coming together you know two coming together as one and seeing ourselves in the other and holding that space for each other. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, and that's so just to kind of summarize a little bit of that too, because it's so beautiful as we talk about boundaries and contracts today. Mm -hmm. the, the, the process of finding the, the boundary for the self so that we are able to show up in a healthier way and make healthier contracts or agreements mm -hmm. with others acknowledging a shared uh a shared truth which we're in so much of and as we're, if we want to give a political example which is very relevant today and does need to be on the table and discussed you know we can't um we have to be able to create space for shared truths even when they are different and um and so okay Kind of maybe we'll step it back a little bit and take a look at the individual. So if we look at boundaries as far as the individual is concerned, I love what you were saying on getting in touch with your feelings. Mm. First step so often is knowing what you feel about a situation, a person, a job, a, a political stance, a, whatever it is, you have a feeling about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't care how robotic you are, <laughs> most people are having a reaction. It's just, are you aware of it? And mm -hmm. and so that baby step process with a therapist, with a friend, um, or if you are, you know, if we're able to with ourselves to ask ourselves the question, what am I feeling in this moment, in this situation with this person. Mm -hmm. I'm honoring that truth. Yeah. And so much of that, and it's not about it being right or wrong. That's kind of that non-judgmental awareness part. Cause sometimes it's like, well, I feel, I feel like they're being horrible and they may not be. Maybe they are, mm -hmm. maybe they totally are. <laughs> but sometimes, they're not. You're actually, you know, sometimes we're triggered. Somebody else is actually triggering something. Most of the time, that's really what's happening is it's actually something that is internal for us. But we still need the boundary all the same because the when we're getting triggered or, you know, whatever, it's, it's really just that ability to step away or to take care of ourselves so that we can get to a more non-reactive state. Yeah, achieve a little bit more neutrality and a healthy place for ourselves. And that's a process. It's not something that happens overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, I hear so much of like, well, you shouldn't have feelings about that. And, you know, you're just being reactive and uh, not to me, but I see that in the in the landscape. Mm -hmm. And it's not honoring people's truth. And there's healing work to be done for all of us. But um, if somebody's highly reactive and they put up a boundary with you, we have to honor that. We can't infringe on each other's boundaries, mm -hmm. even if we don't agree with them or they're a reaction to something. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess as we look at the boundary conversation, I'm, that honoring of truth is kind of that step number one. And then we look at kind of how do, so how do we share a boundary? Or if I notice that I'm starting to get upset about something, Mm -hmm. And every time that I'm around Megan, I get really closed off and um, I feel uncomfortable and I'm aware I bring, you know, she's making some comments that kind of always make me feel shitty. And I don't know if it's me. I don't know if it's her. I can't quite tell. So what would a boundary, what, what you know, what kind of be like our, our, our process in that, in that sort of situation? Well, there are two ways in which I see that we can set boundaries. One is we can set the boundary internally. We know that we're setting the boundary and we cannot tell the other person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or 
we can set the boundary and tell the other person. Mm -hmm. I tend to believe that the latter is usually a better approach. Mm -hmm. It's not that one is right or wrong. And sometimes it might serve the situation best to just have that boundary, that agreement within yourself. And maybe you don't have to share, maybe it's not necessary and it won't help the situation. But often if we set boundaries with other people and we're still around them, for instance, like we can either set the boundary, maybe the boundary will entail, maybe our boundary is that we can't talk to that person ever. We have to completely remove ourselves from that situation. Okay, well that's gonna be super clear to the person. We've set that boundary, they're out of our life, done. But I think it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to come to that. Usually, sometimes yes, but choosing love in this situation would be to try to set boundaries in such a way where you can have this contract, this agreement. You set the boundary for yourself and then you have the contract, the agreement with the other person where you, this is a latter option, you say to them, Megan, I, you know, so this starts with communication, right? Having the courage to communicate and be really honest about how someone's making us feel and then communicating that to them. And hopefully they will be in a place where they can receive mm. that communication. I've found that the best way to get people to receive, especially difficult messages through uh, delivering that message with love I truly believe that the way that we win people over is always and actually only with love. Like if you were to go at Megan and say, Megan, you're making me feel like shit. You, this, that, you know, you're pointing the finger. She's probably likely going to get more reactive and on the defense. But if you come to her and say, Megan, you know, I, and you can preface it by saying, I'm not, I'm bringing this up. I know it's going to be a hard conversation. I'm not doing it to trigger you. I don't want you to get upset. I understand if you do, but I hope we can have a really like level headed conversation about this and zoom out a little bit and keep our emotions, you know, balanced. <laughs> um, and you can even start by saying, you know, I love you. You're one of my greatest friends or whatever it may be. But I tend to find that sometimes I feel this way around you. And I don't know if it's just if it's me or maybe I'm projecting something onto the situation or if it's I don't think it's just you. You know, it takes two to tango. It always takes two to tango. But, you know, how do I say this? Taking some responsibility and accountability for your own self in that situation is huge too. And, and, and acknowledging that it's not, it's, it's usually never just the other person. Um, so that's a great way to set a boundary with love in such a way that we don't have to run away from situations that setting boundaries and having this contract with someone, this agreement. So from there, you know, you're letting them know that you're setting the boundary and the boundary, maybe you say, Megan, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna take a step back from our relationship for now. Maybe not completely, like I still want you in my life, but I just need some space and some separateness from now on uh, for a little while. And um, maybe she says, actually, Carly, I don't want that. I don't want the separateness and the space. Can we work on this together? I actually really, I see why you are feeling the way that you're feeling and I don't want you to feel that way. I care about you a lot. So can we work on this together? And then comes in the contract, the agreement. Then you know, you say you and Megan decide together. What, what, okay. Yeah. You, you might say, Megan, that feels good. Thank you. And um, I'm scared to do this because I don't trust. I don't necessarily fully trust that it's going to move forward in a way that's okay, but I will, for the sake of trust, have some trust in this situation because I want it to work out. So can we decide, can we have an agreement about how we're going to move forward together and try this new way of being and doing together? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And it's, um, I, I want to draw some attention to that part when we move from boundary to communicating the boundary and moving into contract. Cause I think it's really important when it comes to empowerment to within collectives that um, 
we, we talked a lot about infringing on boundaries. So the difference between moving into contract, negotiating a contract, which is we're, we are both committed, both sides are committed to exploring truth and to taking some accountability. Mm -hmm. And to a certain degree, I like I, I like contracts, the, the concept of contracts and agreements, all of this being fluid, because mm -hmm. it's also saying what's the outcome we're looking for? Mm -hmm. Do we have a shared vision? So a shared vision, what is a successful friendship? <laughs> you know, what does an empowered friendship look like or um, an empowering family dynamic? Yeah. You know, with a mother, a brother, a sister, a, um, a, you know, a friend in business. We do the same thing. It's the same concept, which is one, are we on the same page with what healthy looks like, what we would like? Let's, let's try to see if we have the same vision and desire. Because if that's off, probably not going to get very far. Mm -hmm. And then what you pointed out that's so beautiful and so true, and I point, you know, as we look at healthy negotiation and contracts versus somebody trespassing boundaries, is both people come to the table with some accountability. Mm -hmm. And a desire to see the other person, I genuinely want you to be happy. You yeah. genuinely want me to be happy. We're hoping we can do that together. Mm -hmm. And now we're healthy adults, able to have a healthy dialogue, able to work on it because life is work. It's not easy. We don't always align like this. Things come up. But now we can have a productive, healthy thing. So, but the trespassing a boundary, I want to touch on quickly too, so that we can differentiate. So I had a lot of trouble and still to this day have to be like, <laughs> which one is happening <laughs> um, the trespassing of a boundary I'll give one small example of something that put me in a you know it's like I say I need space when I'm in the communal space I'm happy to engage and I want to be here with everybody and I want to give you all of my energy in this but I am not able to decide, I need a, you know, a separate space. And some of you like, well, you should be able to do that without taking, you should be able to whatever it is, X, Y, and Z. Essentially what I'm requesting or needing, my need that I'm expressing, um, there's a problem with it. And, and, and it's not even like it's a brat, it's like, well, if I can't get this, then I'll leave the situation. I will step away. Um, but when somebody, when you give options on a table and somebody goes, no, you should just change. Mm -hmm. I don't accept any of your options. The problem is you needing to change. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that is really tricky because there might be some truth to it, right? So even in my situation, maybe I have to work on, you know, being slightly less reactive to certain triggers. You know, emotionally just get really, it's too much for me. Um, so there might be some truth to it, but that for me, this is a very clear sign of when somebody is not respecting a boundary. Yeah. And, um, and they're actually controlling or telling you what you should or should not be okay with uh, instead of encouraging, again, having that healthy contract of yes, you can do that, absolutely. Or no, I'm not really able to give you that kind of space. So, so maybe it's better for you to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to kind of, I don't know if, there, if you have any thoughts on just that, that slight, there's that, you know what I mean? It's just this kind of gray zone in here when we start to identify when somebody maybe is manipulating or not respecting the concept of that boundaries, um, how you can kind of identify when somebody's not really empowering you. They're wanting you to be different. Yeah. So it's, I mean, it's a complex question and scenario. I think there are many answers, but so the number one thing you talked about respect and respecting boundaries, it's really important that we understand what feels respectful and disrespectful to other people and check in with them constantly. And towards that end, it's an iterative process. So setting boundaries is really an experiment. It's yeah, like, I love like, that. Yeah. So giving it a, a chance, like it takes 
it takes working with the other people or person in this situation to kind of figure out what feels good. It takes some playing and experimenting. And so if you say, if, if they, if someone just comes to you and says, Carly, well, to the example that you gave just a minute ago about, you said, when you're in the communal space, you're happy to give your full energy and attention. When you're in your own space, you need that space for yourself and whatever you're doing there. And then the person says to you, well, no, you shouldn't need that. That's not fair, right? That's not respecting your needs, but they might instead, if they don't understand, they might inquire as to why you need that. So instead of saying you should not need that because I don't yet understand, I might say, well, Carly, can you explain to me more why you need that? This is what I'm hearing from you. Uh, and then I could repeat, you know, what you said just to make sure I'm understanding correctly and then continue on and say, can you explain to me more what you mean by this? If, if I did in fact, um, un understand you correctly. Mm. And then through that conversation, through that dialogue, dialogue is another practice of love. It's, it's through dialogue that we begin to understand ourselves and others more. It's through understanding others that we begin to understand ourselves more and vice versa. It's really a, a reciprocal kind of relationship and process. Win-win. Uh, I love it. That's, that's the best thing about love is that when we choose love and we act with love and we use dialogue as a practice of love and, and there are so many other practices of love. Uh, it's just, it's always win-win. Both parties always learn something. So coming to the situation with just trying to understand more why I don't understand you mm. and coming to the situation from a place of more innocence versus being like, well, this is in my mind the right way or the way things should be. I don't, and instead of pushing that on you, allowing you the space to explain to me how you feel. And, um, and then from there, then I can, hopefully the outcome is that I understand you better and your needs better. And then I say, okay, well, that makes sense. Now I understand why you need your space and your time. I'm going to give that to you and let's see how this works out now. Let's see if we can find maybe a happy medium. Is there like a, a middle ground? Is, can we meet halfway here? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I find that usually when, when we're willing to have these conversations, when we're willing to understand each other better, um, that's when the outcome, it's like what you talked about earlier, actually having a shared vision and understanding what our vision is, really starting with that. It's like we can start from the end goal. We can say, okay, what is our vision? Um, what do we want to do together? What are we what is the point of being here together? Why are we here together? Do we have a shared vision? Do we understand where we're headed? Yes. And as long as we have that, the vision, we can get through, I believe, the most difficult situations. It reminds me of Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning, um, the Holocaust survivor, psychiatrist uh, or psychologist. I always forget if he was a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but in any case, similar. He talked about, uh, I just read that book for the second time because I'm actually doing a podcast of my own on search for meaning, but like the modern version of it yeah. with my friend, Aaron. And Viktor Frankl talked about how important vision was for the people in the concentration camps, that the ones that had a vision of where they were headed even if they weren't totally sure that that vision was going to come true, they found so much more meaning in that and were able to beat the odds of you know, the horrific um, conditions of the concentration camps and make it out because they had that vision. So vision is really important for us on a personal level. They also talk about like, there are studies that show that um, Students, high school students who have a vision for their future are more likely to do better in life, like overall and get a good job and, you know, be able to strive forward through difficulty and challenges. And the same is true in relationship with anybody. It could be in a friendship. It can be in a work relationship. It can be in a partnership. It's always coming back to that vision. What are we doing here together? What is the goal that we're trying to achieve? Is it the same? And 
then, and if it's not, is it time to go our separate ways? Mm -hmm. Or maybe we're just misunderstanding each other and we have to get on the same page. Maybe it actually is the same vision, but we're describing it in different ways, who knows? Or maybe our visions can come together. Maybe they're not so opposite that we can't do something. But starting there, kind of like, yeah, from, from the top and then working our way down, I think is helpful. And then we can start to, um, I just went on a tangent. <laughs> we can start to, that's that's a great place to start with figuring out, you know, is it really worth this experiment that we're talking about? Oh, we looped fully to where I want to loop back to. Yeah. Uh, I loved, I want to call out two things that you said and kind of circle in, you know, form up all of this again. Um, I just love dialogue itself as a practice of love. Yes, yes, yes. And all the more reason, right, when we start looking into our education and, and, and the issue with how our media has done so many things, we can, we can get to the core and understand that the reason that we're having, struggling to have more love is because we are not being taught how to speak with each other. The, the art of conversation has been completely stripped away and it is essential. Uh, we're living in a world of sound bites and curation and labels and identity. So it's not about negotiating and exploring truth together in mm -hmm. this experimental way that we're talking about. And we'll go back into this. I love that. And it's so important. That's another way, this fluid way that we're talking about. No, yeah. it's very much of somebody gives me a sound bite. I'm going to attach myself to that sound bite. That is now me. That is now my truth. Now I'm going to feed off this sound, but, and, and there's no, so we don't have builds and nuance. You know, it's very, um, very black or white, which is just not our nature. It's not our truth. And, um, and it makes it almost impossible for love to exist. Unity to exist in a, in a way when we're constantly trying to pull ourselves apart and make sure that, um, uh, yeah, that we like, our curation of, of our truth, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that you mentioned, and I, I don't feel like this is discussed enough and it's so, so, so important. Boundaries as an experiment, mm -hmm. they're fluid. Contracts as an experiment. We look at this and, you know, in marriage and God bless me, you know, my, my partner, my my ex-husband, I still hate saying that. I had the most amazing relationship on the planet and still love so much because both of us were so committed to loving each other. It was through that commitment to loving each other and wanting what was best for each other and honoring our truth and understanding that life is changing and fluid that we were able to honor and, and renegotiate our contract, which eventually was maybe we sh are not meant to share a contract at this moment in time. You know, I mean, our contract has been served and that's okay, you know, but it's fluid. But our infrastructure, our systems, our storytelling currently is not fluid. It's very ancient fortress. It wants a forever contract for an individual, which is insane, right? Are you going to be the same person in 10 years as you are now? I hope not. Right? I mean, what kind of, and now we're going to assume that so you know our boundaries in order for as we grow our boundaries are going to change those are going to become more fluid because we're working on ourselves so we don't need to have the same kind of boundaries with the same people we might change and our contracts with each other have to change mm -hmm. and if we can get better at that conflict and the letting go of contracts and letting them evolve instead of making it into this Oh, horrible, you know, now you've you've violated the contract. Well, it's, it's, are, are we on forever contracts here? It's something about that seems 
completely impractical, wrong, and now we're asking people to behave in ways that are uh, problematic. Mm -hmm. So I, I really appreciate that. I just wanted to really highlight it because I, I feel like our, again, old school, old paradigm love concept is that the contracts are forever in whatever, right? We're going to do a business together, you and me, and we're going to start something. Mm -hmm. If you care about me and I care and we come up with a vision and this is that, then, you know, 20 years, we're forever. This is going to work. <laughs> We're going to get it to work. I mean, it's great. We're going to have a shared vision, but we're going to constantly be in renegotiating that contract. Yeah. And maybe we grow in it, you know, and because even in 10 years, we're going to change. And maybe in those changes, through those changes, we're still able to grow together and change together. Um, not that we have to, but if we decide to and it works out that way, then great. If it's not, why push it? Why? Right push that boundary that we're finding ourselves up against where it's like things are really not working and the vision's really not truly not aligned anymore. Why, why do we force ourselves to stay in situations just because someone told us, society told us, you know, that you're supposed, supposed to do this. Why do we have such a hard time just doing what we want, what we, not only what we want, because that's that's a loaded, you know, phrase. Yeah. It can mean a lot of things. But when I say what we want is what I mean by that is what is truest to our heart's desire in that moment. Um, maybe not in that moment, but like that overall situation. Can we get real enough with ourselves, honest enough with ourselves, to be honest with others and to have the courage to be who we are yes but a lot of a lot of us have issues with that it's scary to be who we are um yourself. <laughs> <the true. laughs> to love yourself the true you to love each other the true yeah. the true other it's like that quote is it marion william it's not marion williamson that said it but she quotes it often she says maybe it was i don't know but the quote is and it's so cliche, I feel like, cause, or not cliche, but I feel like this is overused. So I, I, I don't think I've ever said it like out loud or on a podcast or anything, but it, it is so relevant to this conversation. It goes, our greatest fear is not that we are inadequate. It's that we're powerful beyond measure. Yes. And it just reminds me of what we're talking about. It's like, I think our greatest fear is just sometimes being who we are and and owning that, really, really owning that. And that can be super, super hard. Um, and I really liked, you mentioned a few times the word respect and how do we know when we're feeling disrespected? How do we know if we're disrespecting someone? Um, it reminds me that without respect, there is no love. And not only respect from others, and how we respect others, but also how we respect ourselves and honor ourselves. Yes. So, yeah, I just thought of that because in talking about being who we are and being true to what we want and not being afraid of that, it's an act of self-respect and self-love to go for that. Yes. Yes. It's, um, I was hoping that we would get to this place and, and I think we're well positioned for it. And you'll love, I was listening to one of my favorite um, astrology podcasts uh, the other day, a girl named Molly, she's so cute. And uh, she, and she's, she's, she summarized a point when it comes to the, the idea of self-love as collective love. And she said it in a way, it, it, it's, you know, it's not new, but it was concise and, and they were strong. It was a strong sentiment of, you know, the honoring of the self and the truth of the self and the respecting of the self is so important. And we have to ask ourselves, what would we do if we actually believed that every single person was capable and powerful of taking care of themselves? If we, who would we allow ourselves to be and how would we treat them differently? 
Because so often we think that the loving act is to actually pity someone. Mm -hmm. Stay, or again, that kind of self-sacrifice, that sort of, yes, but they are just, but the truth is it's really not a loving sentiment or vibration to give to somebody else if I'm like, well, you know, poor Samantha, you know, Samantha just really can't take care of herself. And so I have to take care of her. Yeah, I do. No, I, I do because Samantha just can't. I'm, it's very disempowering. It's the most disempowering thing that we can do. And, and how we treat other people is how we're treating ourselves. Mm -hmm. I always believe that love should be what you can to another. You have it within you. You have it within you to figure it out. Mm -hmm. you have it within you to do what you, and, and that sort of, that yes, you can sentiment for all of us that we all have the power and it does begin, though, like we're talking about this, the self-love and the importance of boundaries is encouraging other people to understand their boundaries and to practice them and to respect, them, even if we don't always agree with them, right? If my brother were to say to me, like, well, you know, Carly, I'm putting up a boundary because of whatever thing. And I'm like, oh, my God, does he seriously think that? <laughs> that I've been, and I'm like, I've done nothing but support this. And if he were to say that, and if I get into my ego, I'm going to have a reaction to that boundary and be like, mm -hmm. you don't have a right to, to have one on this. Like, you've got to be kidding me. Um, my The part of me that is bigger than that and understands that that's my own reaction would go, absolutely. Good mm -hmm. you. I'm happy to do that. You take care of yourself, babe. Do what you got to do. And that allows him to own himself you know, and, and, and really work on, uh, even if I do it. So it's not that just giving me chills. <laughs> I love you so much. You're just amazing because, you know, and I'm saying that because I know you and I've, I know that you would do that. Like that is who you are. You, that's exactly how you'd say it. You say, okay, I, I don't, I don't fully understand it necessarily yet, but I will, especially through, you know, giving you this, this right, this it's your prerogative. And how you feel, regardless of whether I understand it or not, or see it or not, your feelings are valid. Your feelings are valid, and I want you to take accountability for them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that, and the only way to do that is is to encourage you to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, to keep reflecting. And so uh, that you know, the boundaries for ourselves. It's like one of my my you know, lifelong, one of my best friends, we used to say, please take care of yourself so that I don't have to. <laughs> it actually is a little bit selfish in some ways. It's like, get it together, whatever you got to do. <laughs> like, get it together. I'll happily support you. But like, it is to all of our benefits. It serves everyone. Knows how to take care of themselves mm -hmm. and emotionally. And that we encourage people and support people on their journey to doing it because it does not happen overnight. Yeah. And it doesn't happen alone. I don't think you mean that it's like we're all just supposed to not take care of each other at all. Oh, no. Here, you know, together to do that, to help each other, but to empower each other. One, one of the ways in which we help each other. And we also um, help people through emotional you know, difficulties or physical difficulties is by being there for them and empowering them through the process. But, but yes, it is also self-serving and serving to the whole when we all know how to take care of ourselves. And um, yeah, I just wanted to I, make sure that. Yeah, I came across the right way. No. <laughs> well, I'll say it in this way too. Yeah, it's, it's less, it gets back to what you were saying in the beginning that mm -hmm. compassion and love for each other, the boundaries are what allow us to do that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if we go through different phases, there are times in my life, there were times in the past, especially, where I didn't have anything to give. Mm -hmm. I was exhausted mm -hmm. and I didn't know myself very well, or I did, but I didn't have a lot of love for who I was. Um, uh, you know, I was working through my own shit and it was, and it was some dark stuff and I had to write, you know, whatever. It was confusing. I wanted to help, but every time I tried to help, I would make it worse mm -hmm. because I just didn't quite have, 
I needed some time and some space to, to do some, some healing work and to get stronger. And now it's very different. Now at this point in my life, and maybe it changes again and for other people, again, we go in and out of phases. Now it doesn't take as much away from me. Giving is easy. And if anything, it feels because it's coming from a different place and I've healed certain things. So it's, it's, it's fun and it's beautiful and I'm able to hold a lot more weight because I don't take it on in the way that I did when I was younger. And also when you're being given to, when your, your energy source is being replenished, not only by, def I mean, definitely it's so important the way we take care of ourselves and how we replenish and, and nurture and nourish ourselves, but also that needs to come from the outside. We live in an interdependent exactly. ecosystem and world. So we need to be around people and in relationships and situations that are nurturing, that are nurturing our growth. That's love, the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's or another's growth. And that's where the self-love kind of, I know we've talked about this before, but movement, I think, sometimes gets self-love wrong in the sense that they, it, it is sometimes, I think, the message is sent that you're just supposed to cultivate self-love on your own without the help of anyone else. And that's not true. We need to be in environments that are supportive of our growth and that's where you know coming back to boundaries when and contracts uh, but specifically boundaries you know if we're finding ourselves in an environment that is not nurturing us as much as we're nurturing it that's not giving to us as much as we're giving to it if the process is not reciprocal it cannot be a place of love love is contingent on reciprocity giving and receiving and so Sometimes we have to create that boundary where we say either I'm drawing the line, this is as much as I can give because I'm not getting enough to kind of replenish me um, or like I'm getting this much, so I'm giving this much. Okay, you want to give me this much, so I'll give you this much. Mm -hmm. And these are like emotional giving, financial giving, there's a lot of different kinds of giving, you know. Uh, but yeah, that's that's a really important part of um, I think the conversation too to remember that it's it's all reciprocal and there is interdependence. Absolutely, and interdependence is really only possible when we can own our own sovereignty. Mm -hmm. we, when we know who we are, mm -hmm. know we have we are capable. It's exactly that boundaries. We're able to negotiate and experiment with boundaries. Um, with others in groups, this is where we can get to a place of interdependence. Codependency being I overgive or I overtake. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we've come from in our societal structures and as individuals. Yeah. And the, the balancing, but so much of we can't really be in healthy interdependent until we really start to come into it. You know, everything happens in process but it really is through that sovereign self mm -hmm. that understands its own boundaries so that I have to have the ability to walk away. I have to have the ability to choose. It's so interesting, your movement, the just choose love and so much of our evolution as we shift into higher levels of consciousness and interdependent capabilities, it is really all about the spiritual journey. It's really about choice. Mm -hmm. And if we take away people's ability to choose, they can't make the choice. You know, there's no, and, and becoming more conscious of the fact that everything that we do in our lives and every single action is a choice. Mm -hmm. And again, but again, the shifting, so it just made me think of you know, the, the interdependent concept really does rely heavily on the idea of sovereignty and respecting sovereignty. Mm -hmm. Totally. And boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, and then these, and then we can get to the place of like healthy contracts, which I'm excited for us to, I'll just on this call, but like, I'm excited as a society for us to get to a place where that can start to happen. We, I mean, we have it in pockets, right? Like, there yeah. are bits, but like really to see some powerful co-creation, interdependent co-creation that's sovereign, that's equal, that understands these universal 
spiritual principles of love and can embody them yeah at this high contract collective level is like yeah it's really cool to see it happening on an individual level i see so many of us moving into a space of realizing that the contracts and agreements that we've had with each other that are usually like the informal ones that are usually they are informed by the formal ones so like the I don't know if that made sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the informal contracts that or agreements that you and I might have together in a friendship uh -huh. they are usually informed by how we view formal legal contracts in society or some, you know. Um, but now people are realizing, well, the way the kind of like wisdom, wisdom or knowledge or information that I've been basing these agreements that I make with my friends or my partners or whatever, like casually are really not, they're not working. Like well, they're, they're, they're too confining. They're too restricting. They're not allowing enough room for growth. And um, so it's cool to see individuals moving out of that space. And then as a result, because the collective is merely just a reflection of the individual, individuals are now starting to form, form communities and businesses that reflect these values of not wanting to be confined by such strict parameters. Okay. Yeah. And um, it reminds me, you know, you mentioned black and white thinking and all or nothing thinking. And when it comes to contracts and agreements, it doesn't have to be all or nothing that, or black and white. There's a time for black and white. There's a time for all or nothing. Like if, when we think of boundaries, so, you know, if we are experimenting, if we experiment over and over and over again with in a certain situation with setting these boundaries and we try different things and it's just not working, we keep trying, we keep trying, but it's not working. There is a time, right, where we have to make things black and white and say, okay, either this needs to change, needs to be all of this, or like it's kind of like an ultimatum. Like I've tried, we've done the work, there's something not working maybe we need to walk away and give each other the choice to walk away. Then it can be all or nothing and, and black and white, but mostly most of life is in the gray area, right? So experimenting with that um, is really important. That's something that I'm working on. I've had working on. I've had a lot of um, attachment to black and white thinking and all or nothing, um, all or nothing thinking, which has gotten the way of me sticking situations out sometimes mm -hmm. and running away instead because I had too high of standards and I was being too critical or strict or um, afraid of experimenting and trying something new and moving out of like shifting my paradigm, my personal paradigm of trying something that is actually not really comfortable for me because it's so foreign. Yeah. But no, thank you for sharing. I think there's a lot, a lot of, um, yeah, it's uh, sorry, I just got bombarded. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Overwhelmed. Uh, you know, it makes me think of it's so, so so much of life can be simplified, right? Like we can we can really just uh, get super simple, and and most things can be explained very simply. However, it is also very. <laughs> We're human beings and we like to make things super complex. And also we, it is, it's like, it's, it's both. It's not all or nothing. It's so simple, but it's also very complex. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, and that's the same thing that even, uh, sorry, I've got some dogs here. Um, yeah. That is, um, that's even the thing with the, the individual versus the collective and looking at um, interdependent and healthy interdependence. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of the teaching on creative leadership, you know, we talk about harmony. Harmony is not conformity. Harmony is not uh, uh, everything staying the same and everybody's super happy. And it's like this, like, ooh, like, you know, like we've got all kinds of visions of what uh, the, 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 what I think is so beautiful when we understand these, these high level concepts is that they are all paradoxes. Mm -hmm. And so it is not about absolutes. That's always been the trap. 
the trap has been the absolute. And Absolutely. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't help it. Bad, bad joke. <laughs> But it is, you know, so often, and I've had to remind myself of this also, I tend to be very gray and can get very much into the relative, but I also know that, um, you know, sometimes you do have to make a choice and be a little bit more black and white about things, you know, and so, but so often when we're correcting, we over course correct because we want to move. We think, oh, now I've learned and now I'm wrong. Um, but it really is this middle way and the holding space for the paradox. They're both, they're both accurate. And as we look at healthy contracts, healthy boundaries, self-love, other love, um, you know, the more that we can create space within the self, mm -hmm. hold the paradox for ourselves and for each other, allow both to be true. And, and yes, as you're saying, like, you know, maybe we can find that high standard of incredible love. You know, even if I were to think about it in a, a romantic context or whatever, maybe that vibration, that thing that you've been wanting, that's that high, 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 high standard is really, it's right in front of you or it's right, it's very available. It's just that the way of achieving it or being there or what it looks like is actually something completely different. Right, but that vibration, that sentiment of a standard. And so I find, you know, if we can be honest, if we can be brave enough, as you're saying, courageous enough in this process to experiment. And to know that it's not, we don't need to be overprotective. We don't need to give everything, you know, just allow ourselves to stumble and fumble and, and be on the quest, on the quest. Mm -hmm of finding for ourselves and each other, what does this look like? And now I'm just committed to a quest instead of an outcome. And there's so much more space, you know, within that and so much more joy on that journey than thinking or trying to come up with, you know, exactly what that, that outcome might be. Um, so we can, you know, expand so much more but I, I love that. I think it's so true as we talk about the black and, you know, we can all just get better at experimenting and, and joyfully doing it. We're going to get banged up. We're going to get some bruises and start bleeding a little bit. And it's okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> that hurt. We'll it off. <laughs> yeah. it off. Brush it off and let's go back in. Pain <laughs> is part of it. We don't need to suffer, but, you know, learn from it and, and go back in. Yeah. So we learn so much from suffering too, right? But there's also, there's a line. It's like, yeah. how much suffering is self-inflicted? How much suffering are we inflicting on others that's actually necessary? What can we do to um, alleviate suffering when it's really not necessary? What can we do to avoid suffering when it's really not necessary? But suffering also, there are necessary, um, there are times when suffering is, you just have to go through processes that are, painful, especially when they're new and you're experimenting, you're trying something you're not used to, it can be incredibly like heartbreaking in the sense that it's heart, it's like opening you up. It's mm -hmm. breaking, breaking and maybe it's breaking your heart because of the way you've been thinking about things um, and can find an, an old way of being and doing that old paradigm. But then once you open whole point of you know your heart breaking in a situation I think I know this is so cheesy but I have experienced my, it myself numerous times in my life and I use that 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 breaking open as an opportunity to let newness flood in and light flood in god I'm really cheesy today um <laughs> it, just, it it really um it works like magic and I also love what you talked about just in relation to everything kind of in life being a paradox. I know this this conversation has gotten hella philosophical, but it's me. But um, <laughs> I think that, you know, that this dichotomy, the constant dichotomy of the world that we live in, the dichotomy and the paradox of ourselves um, and who we are together 
and how this has been something that's been talked about throughout the ages with, you know, dating back to Aristotle and his theory of the golden mean, and then in metaphysics with law and chaos. And with Buddha, he talked about the middle path. It's all about, it's not, yes, we live in this world of opposites that have to coexist together in order for this world to work. There has to be in the dark, there has to be the light, and there has to be the yin and the yang, whatever you want to call it. And the key, like all of these philosophers and gurus said, is finding that you know middle way, the middle path, and being in balance and open to the gray and the black and the white and the paradox of it all. Yeah, exactly. But so much of that, I mean, yes, it's deep, it's philosophical, and it's big, but like, again, all the more reason why we should discuss it, know it, and remind ourselves of it all the time. Mm -hmm. Because it's the most foundational, these are the foundational principles of life. We're experiencing them in different costumes every day. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, but so many people don't because it actually reminds me, I had dinner with someone last night, and he, my friend last night, and he said to me, uh, we we're having a philosophical conversation. He said, you know, a lot of people don't have these conversations um, or they like, talk about these kinds of things. And, and I said, yeah, I'm like a philosopher. I like to philosophize and I know that, but it's because it's so strange to me. I can't imagine just going through life, living like a robot and on an autopilot. I mean, of course there's a lot, there's a lot of beautiful materialistic things to enjoy in this world. And I don't think that sometimes we can get so far down in like the nuances and, and the depths of things that it can take us out of the present moment. And we, we are in this world, in this physical body, and there are a lot of like fun, um, frivolous surface level things to enjoy that we should. But also, I think in order to find meaning and purpose in life, you have to, you know, contemplate, you have to, have a, a reason of why you're here. Otherwise, what's the point? And so uh, you actually had a note from earlier. You, you had said something about something that reminded me of just like how so much of so many of us operate on autopilot. And I think it was, we really started the conversation with talking about the importance of, you talked about self-awareness and self-honesty. Mm. The only way we can get really honest with ourselves is the first step is being self-aware and and then the second step is like a willingness to be real with ourselves and to not just live on autopilot with the tendencies that we might have as you know a human being or with i don't know falling into the falling into the trap of one way of doing things as a society and feeling confined to these traditions and these norms but having the courage to say i don't want to do that i don't want to be a robot i want to do I want to live a life that is true to me. Yes. And what will make my life feel like a life well lived. Yes. Yes. We're getting there little by little. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we've had a nice. <laughs> I'm thinking of wrapping on this concept of yes, finding, finding the truth as we break through norms. I want to summarize because it's very true. Mm -hmm. That's when we look at the purpose of boundaries and contracts, it is so that we can go deeper on our philosophical journey of understanding ourselves, our spiritual understanding, um, our meaning, deep, deep meaning, um, and connection to ourselves, each other, the planet, and the universe in a much, much more uh, satisfying way. And how we get there is through this concept and the deepening of the, the, the mechanism of boundaries and contracts. And bringing our awareness to ourselves, that truth, that greater journey. And then this, and I love it, I'm gonna keep it moving. This experiment, this exploration mm -hmm. of boundaries and, and creating, co-creating contracts. That's so beautiful. <laughs> well, it's yeah, it's a beautiful way for us just to kind of simplify a little bit of you know what's the purpose of it, and it allows us to come more into our truth. Mm -hmm. 
and, um, and encourages other people to go deeper into theirs as well. Because if we're going to break out of social norms in the way in the old paradigm, that's how we start to do it. Um, creating space, to, um, creating space, to find that deeper truth within ourselves, that self love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll just say, I'll relay one more kind of sentimental quote that reminds mm -hmm. me of what you just said and something you said earlier, Victor Frankl. Frankel also said, between stimulus and response, there is a space, and within that space lies our growth and our freedom. Mm. Um, actually, no, I just butchered that. Between stimulus and response, there is a space, In that space is our ability to choose our response, and in our response lies our growth and freedom. And to your point earlier, I think I still butchered that the second time, but I think I got all the important points in, which is- choice. I'm very tired today. I'm <laughs> emotionally exhausted. But um, I think that you and our listeners will catch my drift. And the point is, is that we always have a choice. We should always have a choice. We should always, ultimately we do, but do people make it easy, easy for us to have a choice? Not always. And sometimes people try to make us think that we don't. But it is really important to give each other the power of choice, the power to choose love, the power to choose love for ourselves and others. And um, the idea that boundaries and contracts are a place where we have the, we should have the ability to choose, to experiment, to do it together, to understand each other better, to work together. And I'm, this is something I'm working on. I think it's a really important to remember um, for me that, and I think for other people, we're not alone in this. And so not to be afraid of it. I think that's like, I think one of my biggest takeaways too from what you just said is, is that to remember that we're not alone. And if we can remember that, boundaries and contracts don't have to be as scary. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for that reminder. Yeah, as we can all do more boundaries and contracts with ourselves, with each other, we can remind ourselves and each other that, yeah, we're, we're all working on it. Like, <laughs> I'm trying out this new thing. Yeah. Can you try it out with me? Yes. <laughs> um, well, thank you again, Sam. Thank you. And uh, and sharing today, I really appreciate continuing this conversation with you. Me too. I look forward to the next one. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Links are below. And yes, any questions, suggestions, or resources on this topic, too, please do put them in the comments below. Much love.